Hi, I'm James Wood here, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. On the second Wednesday of each month, we discuss the latest bioscience publications. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to our new URL, which is academic.oup.com forward slash bioscience. And before we get started with today's show, I wanted to make a really quick pitch for the AIBS Communications Bootcamp. That's a two-day program that will be held February 27th and 28th in Washington, D.C., and it's geared toward helping scientists become more effective when they communicate with non-technical audiences. So thinking there about you know members of Congress, the media, uh, podcast hosts, etc. Uh, the first of those was just held last week, and it was a lot of fun. So please check io.aibs.org forward slash bootcamp for more information, and we'll hope to see you there. And for today's show, I'm joined by Craig Lidicote. He's a researcher with the University of Adelaide in the South Australian government's Department of Environment, Water, and Natural Resources. He's here to talk to us about microbiomes in the environment and their potential to affect human health. You've probably heard about human microbiomes, which are the microorganisms that we coexist with and that influence our health. But his research is more taking a look from the outside in. Uh, We'll let him explain that. So let's get straight to the interview. Craig, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, James. Pleased to be here. All right. Before we get started and speaking about your article in particular, I was hoping we could chat a little bit about human microbiomes in general. Uh, And uh, could you give us a little bit of background about that? What is a human microbiome and what's its relevance for human health? Yeah. So increasingly, uh, researchers are finding that um, the microbiome, which is which essentially microbes or communities of microbes, uh, all their sort of genetic material and their byproducts, if you like, are uh, increasingly related to our health. You know, the uh, expression of, uh, of genes from the microbiome, you know, outnumbers our own genome by, by a factor of 100 or more. Um, they, they have a huge role in our metabolism and also um, development of our, of, our whole, um, of our whole physiology, really. So uh, increasingly, they're, they're recognised as, as just playing a huge role in our, in our health and, and our homeo. Uh, stasis, if you like. Okay, so are we talking here about things like uh, beneficial bacteria? Yes, that's right. Yep. Okay, so what happens to a person if uh, his or her microbiome uh, somehow ends up amiss, if, if the bacteria are absent when they should be present or present when they should be absent? Uh, you know, what are some health problems that can occur if things are not as they should be? Yeah, so that, that kind of uh, gets to this idea of... Um, Having a healthy microbiome, and uh, in contrast, what, what you call dysbiosis, where the proportion of, of beneficials and, and pathogenic bacteria are out of balance, if you like. So, um, if you perhaps don't have the di- right diet, or you've had antibiotics sort of use, um, you can get that balance out of whack. And um, increasingly, they're finding that that has uh, uh, detrimental effects on your um, immune system function, and also uh, that has flow-on effects for a, a whole range of diseases. So more and more they're, they're connecting this dysbiosis or, or uh, having your different microbiomes out of balance, connecting that to a whole range, of, whole range of diseases. And generally speaking, you know, what kind of ailments are we talking about here? Are these autoimmune disorders, that kind of thing? You know, you've got examples of uh, allergies, um, eczema, hay fever, um, autoimmune, where essentially – your immune system is is malfunctioning and starting to attack uh, perhaps uh, food and normally harmless sort of allergens from the environment or it starts attacking yourself as in your own tissues um, or also uh, just setting up a chronic inflammatory sort of situation. So inflammatory bowel disease and, and Crohn's disease and all that sort of thing. So there's a whole range of, of diseases that are linked to dysbiosis. Okay. So I think that gives us a baseline of sorts of, you know, kind of the human element. Um but let's talk now about the environment. So are these bacteria picked up by people just from, you know, their everyday encounters? Yeah. So the, the, the central idea of, um, of the article is this a biodiversity hypothesis uh, and a related um, microbial old friends mechanism. So um, that's it in our modern developed or, um, you know, increasingly depauperate, uh, meaning lower biodiversity surroundings. We're basically lacking contact with environmental microbial diversity uh, and also potentially certain key microorganisms, which are, are termed those old friends. Um, and these are thought to have co- co-evolved with us and play an important role in the education and also regulation of our immune system. So uh, these microbes from the environment basically overlap and interact with our own um, 
human micro, microbiota. Okay, and so th- these are things that in eras previous to this one, we would have been exposed to more of them in, say, the soil or something like that. Yeah, that's right. So, look, to give you some examples of some suspected microbial old friends, if you like, um, so we've got, you know, some, some mold pathogens, which, you know, normally you'd think uh, would be bad for us, but uh, this new knowledge is suggesting that if we get uh, the right amount of these uh, microorganisms that can um, keep our immune system on its toes, if you like. So, you know, things like salmonella, E. coli, um, enteroviruses, hepatitis viruses, rotavirus, uh, environmental uh, saprophyte, saprophytes. Um, I guess so things that are perhaps normally harmless but also mild pathogens that, um, you know, traditionally you would think uh, – you know, let's keep that stuff away from us. But, but this new this knowledge is is saying, um, you know, let, let's not be afraid to to get in touch with these um, these organisms. I suppose to to some degree. You would say that our situation in which we're no longer exposed to these at the levels that we previously have, and in fact that we've evolved to be um, exposed to them, is is that a result of our sanitary practices, or is that more a result of the way that we've altered landscapes and that sort of thing, or both? Yeah. So. Um, th- this is an area that uh, uh, Graham Rook has probably uh, reviewed and, and really developed, and also the team of uh, Lena von Herzen and, and her team from Finland. So they've really developed this, these ideas that uh, as we've sort of changed through the development of society, we've you know, gone from a hunter-gatherer and digging in the soil and um, hunting animals and that sort of stuff to you know, agriculture and becoming more settled uh, and then to, you know, living in more urbanised environments and also the whole process of sanitation has really changed our, our external environment. Um, and there's this idea of, uh, so that's, you know, direct contact to start with, but there's this, this idea of aerobiology where um, just living in an environment exposes you to these ambient bugs that are just uh, travelling in the air. So I guess over a period of time as society has changed and changed its surroundings, we've we're exposed to um, less diversity of microbes. And uh, you talk about this occurring on the landscape scale. And I was hoping you could just give us a little bit of insight into, you know, how that, how that process works out. Yeah. So I guess what we are saying is um, in Graham Rook's uh, review paper, he, he put out a call to um, bridge the chasm between um, ecology and medicine and immunology, because I guess this, this thing, which is really, uh, understudied at the moment. It's largely been tackled from a medical researcher focus. Um, we're taking, my, my background is in environmental science and ecology uh, and also soil science. So we're, we're taking the, uh, the angle that can, can we look at um, what's happening in the landscape, uh, take a bigger picture view, I guess, um, and also recognising that, um, you know, environments can be very different and there's a lot you can you can uh, really look at what is different in different environments and, and sort of look at that because, um, you know, different types of environments have their own different characteristic feedstocks and microhabitats for these bugs to live in. So, so therefore, you know, researchers have found that different environments and features of the environment have different environmental microbi- microbiota associated with them. If you like, you know, uh, the, the leaf communities of trees and the root, root communities – um, are different across different sort of species of plants, uh, for example. So different features of the environment have their own different characteristic environmental microbiota. So if, if we're saying these influence our health, then we should be able to observe uh, associations between health outcomes and different types of environment uh, at that sort of big picture um, end-to-end, uh, drawing the sort of connections across the from environments to the environmental microbiota to exposures to, you know, interactions and, and immunomodulatory effects and, and then health, health outcomes is a, is a real challenge and that's sort of a whole uh, team multidisciplinary effort. But I guess we're saying uh, to target that research, let's look at, um, you know, what, what uh, different types and qualities of environment and whether we can see some uh, really stand out associations with with uh, health outcomes that have a a plausible uh, microbiota mechanism um, that we don't really know but I guess by looking at for associations across 
environments and health outcomes, let's pick out some associations to really target, target the research. So this would be a case where in, say, deforested landscapes, you would expect to see uh, reduced biodiversity of microbiota and worse health outcomes. That's right. Um, yeah, but you'd need to, you know, when you're, when you're trying to see it in terms of health outcomes, you, you really need the data. So that's kind of where it uh, becomes tricky to, to really draw that connection. So uh, little pieces of the, I mentioned the sort of linkage between environments environmental microbiomes, you know, how people are exposed, the interactions of, of the environmental microbes and the human microbiota, and then through the health outcomes, it, each, there's basically a chain of evidence. So researchers have kind of looked at uh, different parts of that chain. Um, I guess, you know, I'm going from one end to the other as a way to target research, but really to... Um, to get something definitive, you need the data and sort of build things up slowly, if, if piece by piece, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. So you're kind of looking at, you know, we have some we have some health data and we have some environmental data. Um, is the research challenge linking those together? Yeah, yeah. So I guess my, my background is um, uh, environmental correlation modeling. Um, so I've uh, it's not really covered in this review, but the, the next piece of work I'm working on is, is uh, public health data um, across Australia and looking at um, looking at uh, different aspects of the environment and sort of summarising that over certain areas and then drawing uh, drawing associations between those. But also, you know, at the same time, you need to somehow bring in all these other non-environmental factors that influence health. Uh, you know, and to some degree, you are limited by what data you've got. So you, you can't necessarily look at all of it. But you know, things like lifestyle, socioeconomic status, um, and when you get down to you know, individuals, the diet, the antibiotic use, the, the genetics, the age, it all it all plays a part. So we're limited by the data uh, as to how far we can look into this, but uh, tackling it piece by piece, and I, I guess. Um, the angle that we're taking in this review is, is hey, let's, let's look at different types of environment as a way to target uh, some of this research. What's the, I'm kind of curious about what's the end game there. So let's say that using environmental factors as you know, potential proxies, uh, what do you eventually hope to find out? And then when you have that information, is it actionable? Is there then something that you do from a policy standpoint from there? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just sort of cut to this um example uh, of Japanese researchers who, who look at forest bathing. So they've done studies of people walking in forests and found that um, these uh, volatile organic compounds or, or phytoncides, they call them, uh, have an immune boosting effect. So th there's an example where a type of environment, this, this sort of forest in Japan, uh, is, is showing immune boosting effects. So if, if we kind of look across you know, a whole range of different types of environments, um, whether it's you know groupings or communities of trees or whatever, or types of uh, of soils where people can come into contact with those different features of environment that have their own uh, perhaps beneficial microbial communities associated with that. If we can you know put out uh, new guidelines or, or design principles for how we're going to better design our landscapes or, or bring a bit of land use diversity and also design new green space in the uh, increasingly urban uh, communities, if we can put some of these elements in there that we uh, suspect have can bring some of these benefits, you know, we're going to get uh, uh, benefits for public health and also environmental management at the same time, hopefully. And you mentioned in the article the possibility of looking at this as um, an area of ecosystem services. Um, how would that work? Uh, well, yeah, the, the, I suppose the ecosystem service is, is that it's providing a public health benefit. So this could be a situation potentially in which if we were determining how to manage a given piece of land, we might consider into that decision the fact that um, microbial biodiversity will save us X number of dollars in terms of public health spending. That's, that's, that's the end game, yeah. So uh, you're looking for cost-effective um, outcomes really to, to really – as a prevention or trying to um, give some sort of public health treatment by exposing people to these environments that, that helps, um, you know, stimulate and regulate their immune systems as a bit of, as a background uh, 
thing that's happening, yeah, to basically, um, you know, while, while also trying to encourage in a healthy diet and exercise and all those other uh, factors, but basically to, to just try and control this, these uh, ballooning health system costs that we seem to have in the developed world. And and how do you deal with um in you know I, I'm sure I'm sure this is a problem that's not yet been completely resolved or anywhere near it, but how do you deal with all those confounds? Because you know you have so many things that go along with, um you know living in an urban environment, you know, increases in sedentary behavior, uh, cigarette smoking, uh, dietary changes. How how do you how do you parse that out and figure out what parts are a result of? Um, you know, those other lifestyle factors and what parts are, could be a result of, um, you know, a lack of exposure to natural microbial biodiversity? Yeah, so good, good question, obviously. Um, I guess to, to start with, you know, you might look for nat- natural experiments, you know, the, the sort of observational studies where some of these confounders are controlled to some degree. But as you sort of go into the reductionist sort of view of, of really trying to... Um, isolate some of these mechanisms um you know you sort of more and more have to head into to you know your experiments your mouse models and that sort of thing so there, there is a bit of uh, of recent work where they are looking at at some of this stuff so um sort of have some examples where um so uh Ilka Hansky and colleagues in um 2012 in uh in PNAS found an association between this is a study in Finland uh, found an association between uh, atopic sensitization or, or allergic predisposition um, and skin microbiota and the composition of the surrounding environment. So they, um, from their sort of DNA testing of the skin microbiota, they they found a special role for a, a particular uh, genus of um, Acinetobacter in, in the skin microbiota. So then they, they followed that up with a um, in another study um, by Furquist and colleagues supported that in a mouse model. So um, there's also been some some recent studies where they've basically looking at uh, you know, in mouse models, basically looking at the the influence of some of these particular organisms, um, and basically finding that they can offer protective uh, capacity against allergies to food, or or basically providing some sort of protection uh, against um, virus infections and that sort of thing so but i guess our our sort of angle from the environmental researcher point of view is that um you know there's there's a lot of you can get down to that detail but you know there's going to be redundancy in these species of of microbial world friends and, and also redundancy in the immune pathways there's a lot of complexity uh in the system so you know the membership of the of the microbial world friends is not clear and consistent um these microbes can drive epigenetic effects. Um, we're not just talking about microbes anyway. There's also the uh, the other sort of bioactive agents, those volatile organic compounds, the, the phytoncides I, I mentioned, which can have uh, immune boosting effects. So there's a lot of you can get into that complexity, but but if you take a step back, um, you know, can these things be related to certain environments? And and that's kind of what we're interested in. Um, and at the end of the day, to, to translate that into public health, uh, you know, landscape design, green space design, you need that knowledge of what are the features of the environment that are associated with these things. So, yeah, it's kind of you need to do the the, the big picture stuff and and also drill down into these those uh, those mechanisms with with uh, really controlled experiments. Okay, and and one thing I always wonder is, you know, where is the state of the science on that question right now? You know, um, how far are we into figuring out how much microbial biodiversity is useful? Um, I think we we understand the concept, but how close are we to being able to link those things together in a in a, in a way that would actually be um, actionable for policy decisions? Say, uh, it's it's still a way off. I think. Um the you know when you look at the the science of uh characterizing microbiomes that is still i guess in development you know it's not my area but from what i've seen uh there's a there's almost a revolution in in terms of uh microbiology moving from the traditional system of uh taxonomy where microbes are defined by what they look like and their their sort of outward features to now the the genetic uh, relatedness approach of DNA uh, sequencing. So, 
the whole characterizing of microbiomes is 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 still developing um but in terms of the policy sort of uh approaches um you know there's already uh, a considerable and also growing body of evidence that links you know exposure to natural environments biodiversity and benefits to human health whether that's through encouraging exercise being outside getting your, your vitamin d uh, mental health social and cultural well-being that's linked to a sense of place um you know you're buffering from natural hazards and boosting resilience to climate change controlling vectors of infectious disease you know these are all linked to biodiversity and and getting i suppose people out in amongst nature so there's enough information there for policymakers to to say let's foster those nature-based public health initiatives and, and you know here in our in our state the um the government of south australia has this healthy parks healthy people initiative where they're encouraging these type of things but i guess this takes it another to another level this this sort of microbiome influence and and i think it's really interesting because it, uh you know if we can build knowledge of these uh you know, real connection, biological connection between humans and their environments, you know, that could have profound implications um, to, to, you know, for the future of our lifestyles, our, the way we view public health and, and environmental management. That's interesting. So in a sense, it's another reason to do something that we already know is a good idea. Correct. Yeah, that's right. You know, one topic we often get into um, when we're talking about these sort of large interdisciplinary projects is the challenges of working with the data. Uh, you know, whether that be integrating the data from public health sources or data acquisition. And I'm just sort of wondering, is that something that you've encountered in your work? Yeah, so um, I guess to I've, I've started uh, working with some uh, spatially uh, and thematically aggregated data, if you like. So, you know, and that's pulled together for, for privacy purposes and also reliability purposes. But once you start aggregating data, um, and the reason also using that type of data to really bring in a lot of those confounders. But once you start aggregating data, you've got uh, issues of uh, you know, ecological bias and, and fallacy where you're, you're making a, an assumption for, a, for an area or a group that you know, might apply, you're assuming it applies in general, but it won't apply for everyone there. So um, yeah, working with aggregated data helps you bring in a lot more variables, but um, problems with making the wrong, wrong assumptions. Um, and then I guess when you get into in, more individualised data, more spatially locatable data, there's privacy issues, which, um, you know, and uh, all that, that that come into play. Um, and just the, the availability of that data uh, across the type of um, health outcomes that, that you might want to look at. Uh, and also they're suggesting that, um, you know, these exposures to the, the microbiome, could be sub subclinical or you know asymptomatic, so you're not necessarily seeing health outcomes straight away or, or to start with. But just having that sort of background exposure uh, and things are happening with the immune system that you can't see outwardly, um, so you know they're not getting reported. Um, so just having you know that that requires uh, money to set up the, the research to to get immune immune biomarkers and blood samples and, and all that skin tests and all that sort of thing uh, to track that sort of stuff. So, yeah, the fact that data is not necessarily there and if it is there, it perhaps is at a scale that, uh, that limits you. Yeah, and speaking about the, the subclinical outcomes, that's, that's interesting. So you could have situations, you know, where uh, someone perhaps got one less cold a year but and but you'd really have no way to see that in the data because you know they're not, presumably not showing up at the emergency room or whatever um, because they're feeling a little bit under the weather. Um, so is there the potential that you know the, this kind of um, this kind of question could even be larger than you might see directly in the data that you have? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, if we're not um, we're not getting to the point where people are going to the doctor or you know going to the emergency room or, or having a, a chronic uh, health condition, um, and that's generally where the data is, you know, reported. Um, yeah, so just just the fact that some of these beneficial uh, influences, or the fact that you're not getting these beneficial influences, it drives things in your body that you can't see, uh, is a problem and and something that uh, that limits the research into this. Okay, so there's obviously some complexity and subtlety in the nature of the response to the stimulus. Um, I'm also wondering a little bit about the nature of 
uh, you know, a dose response curve type of situation. You know, obviously it's, you know, good to have a little bit of certain bacteria, uh, but one wouldn't want to be overrun by them. Um, so, you know, how does that work? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, and I think that, you know, we, in, the, in the paper, we've, we've suggested a, uh, a theoretical U-shaped dose response relationship, if you like, that, that, that tries to unify this, uh, this thinking of a, a beneficial influence of microbial old friends and also this more traditional view of, uh, of the toxic effects of, you know, w- within microbiology. So um, it, it draws on a, uh, a, I guess, a hormetic or U-shaped or J-shaped dose-response relationship that, that uh, has been seen as quite generalisable. generalizable. So Edward Calabrese uh, and colleagues have basically put this idea out there that uh, you can get this low-dose stimulation effect and then a, a higher dose uh, detrimental effect. So we've sort of just just uh, b- built on that a bit, if you like, where um, there's possibly this U-shaped relationship where at a low dose, you know, we're not getting exposure to a, if it's the dose being a certain microbial old friend, uh, at a low dose, you're not getting enough exposure to this perhaps key species. And then at some low uh, to moderate dose, you know, the happy middle ground, you're getting the right sort of exposures that keep your immune system, uh, that provide that education and, and regulation of your immune system. And then at the uh, high end of uh, exposure, say, you know, if it's an E. coli or salmonella, those sort of things, the bugs uh, get out of control and do their turn into a, a virulent sort of pathogenic turn on all that sort of uh, behaviour. So, yeah, definitely there is a... We think, you know, a, a U-shaped sort of relationship, but quantifying that, you know, that's that's all uh, not yet done. It's um, we just thought that that was a neat way to to draw a bridge between the microbial old friends thinking and uh, that traditional view. But you know, as well, potentially there's a uh, ecological um, thinking to ecological ecological context to that, where um, in that middle ground, if that corresponds to a uh, you know, an evolutionary expected dose, then perhaps that's a, a long-term stable thing and a, perhaps a maximal biodiversity situation. So we're suggesting that perhaps getting the right dose of microbial old friends might actually correspond to that maximal biodiversity. So um, there's been this question, is it is it diversity or is it critical species? Um, we're suggesting maybe it's both and maybe they occur together. And, you know, uh, one question I hope you'll forgive for perhaps being a little too cynical, but is there a chance that we could increase our, our microbial biodiversity in our bodies um, simply through supplementation rather than through, you know, managing um, our external environments? Uh, does that approach have the same potential or is there something necessarily valuable about actually being exposed in nature? You know, we've noted all the other benefits of being out in nature. Um but from the microbial biodiversity standpoint, is there a chance that there's a shortcut there? I'm sure that there will be corporations out there looking for that solution. Um, but I think, you know, once you, it, it comes back to cost effectiveness, you know, what is the most cost effective way to provide some of these public health benefits? And if it's, if it's through planting trees and encouraging kids to go and play in the dirt, uh, encouraging communities to, to get out there and uh, play a part in their, uh, conserving their their natural, you know, their native uh, vegetation areas, or or take a walk in the park. You know, that's going to be more cost effective than, than trying to isolate certain microbes. Um, and also, um, you know, the the more and more people get into just isolating uh, certain microbes, they're seeing how complicated it can be, and and the fact that there is redundancy, and it's not just going to be one microbe that. That perform, performs this role and, and has this immune system outcome. There's multiple uh, microorganisms, multiple pathways. So, you know, getting back to the cost effectiveness of it, um, and also the other co-benefits. You know, encouraging people to be out there in nature, I think, is the answer. Okay, great. So it's a case where doing the right thing is also most cost effective. That seems like a good place to leave it. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Okay, thanks, Sam. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you and talk to you next time.